Hi friends, once again welcome back to the Nurse Channel. Hope you all are doing fine and uh, preparing well for the upcoming uh, AIMS Norset and the Jibmar examination. So as you all know, this channel is exclusively for nurses and here we are there to help you to prepare well for the upcoming AIMS Norset and the Jibmar examination. So as you all know, we have uploaded so many videos, so many videos, especially for uh, AIMS and uh, Jibmar examinations. And uh, this session also contains 15 very, very important questions uh, which will help you to prepare well for the upcoming AIMS Norset and Jibmar examinations. So these 15 questions, how I have designed like that means we have picture based questions, picture based explanations and previously asked questions also. Okay, so definitely uh, uh, this will benefit you very very well so i request everyone who, who are watching this video to watch the video till the end without skipping because explanation also is very very important okay so before starting the session i request everyone who are watching this video uh, for the first time or who have not subscribed our channel kindly subscribe this channel and share to your nursing friends and kindly enable the bell button so that you will get the notification when we are uploading new videos so without losing time we will move on to the questions so jipmar norset series uh, 15 questions so moving on to the first question in this series. Uh, so the first question for you is a picture based question and uh, this question aims at uh, improving your knowledge regarding the surgical instruments. Okay. So the first question is in the screen right now. The task for you, you is to identify which among the following is a retractor. Okay. So you should find out the retractor from the pictures what I have given in the options. So this is option number A, option number B option number c and option number d so among these pictures you should identify a retractor okay so which is a retractor very easy question so what is the answer so the answer for the question is option number c that is these are the some types of refra uh, retractors okay there are several types of retractors so that we will explain in the uh, explanation session so first of all we will find out what is a retractor so retractors these are the surgical instruments which are used to hold an incision open and it hold back tissues or other objects to maintain a clear surgical fluid or reach other structures okay so that is a retractor so you you, you might have seen in uh, so many pictures and all uh, when we are exposing the in internal organs so we have to separate the tissues with the help of the retractors and we have i am going to discuss about the three types of retractors in, in this uh, explanation session so the first type of retractor is the langenbeck retractor okay this is the langenbeck retractor it is a hook shaped retractor with an l shaped end okay with an l shaped end which is used to keep back tissues or separate the edges of the wound okay so this is one type then another type is the norfolk and norwich retractor so this is a norfolk and norwich retractor it is a self-retaining retractor see here we can see a part where we can keep the um, wounds open with the help of the this part so it is used to keep the deep wounds and cavities open okay so please uh, understand this one to keep the deep wounds because this is very lengthy okay so this part is very lengthy and it is very blunt and it has a very blunt ends to reduce the risk of iatrogenic tissue injury okay so you should identify one more retractor this is the traverse retractor so you may not be find much difference between the norfolk and the norwich retractor the difference is that the traverse retractors that it tip part that is very short okay this is very long and this is very short so as it is long this is used for deep wounds and as it is short it is used for keeping the superficial wounds open so that is a traverse retractor and both have blunt very blunt edges to prevent iatrogenic injuries okay so these are the types of retractors okay three types of retractors that is langenbeck norfolk and norwich and a traverse retractor there are so many other types are also there with the varying sizes and all so for example purpose of you uh, this much is enough okay so another options we will see the another option was a uh, one was the needle holder okay the first first or the third option was the uh, second option was the needle holder so for holding the needles it will come in varying sizes and length depending on the needle and tissue in question okay so this is the needle holder in the tip we can 
um, hold the needle okay so the next uh, uh, one more uh, picture was there that was a uh, dissecting forceps okay so this is a known toothed forceps used for the fine handling of the tissues and traction during the dissection okay and another last option was re regarding a scissor and it is known as the myo scissors and these are the heavy scissors with semi blunt ends okay with semi blunt ends which is often used to cut thick tissues or sutures either straight or curved okay so for suture removal we can use this or for cutting the thick tissues we can use a heavy scissor which is named as the myo scissors okay so from the first question you are getting information regarding the four important surgical instruments and you can expect this type of questions in the upcoming exams okay so straight away we will move on to the next question in our series that is the second question so the question is the freshly prepared ORS solution that is oral rehydration solution should be used within how many hours so freshly prepared ORS should be used within how many hours so that is a question for you uh, it is slightly confusing so you can answer it correctly options are option number A 6 hours option number B 12 hours option number C 24 hours and option number D 20 hours ok so freshly prepared ORS how many hours we can keep in room temperature so the answer is 12 hours it is not 24 hours okay so we will have an explanation regarding this question so when ORS is prepared it should be consumed or discarded within 24 12 hours sorry within 12 hours if it is kept at room temperature or within 24 hours if refrigerated okay so this is an important point if we are refrigerating we can use it up to 24 hours then we have to discard and if you are not refrigerating and if you are using it in the room temperature then we have to discard it within 24 hours or we have to use it within 24 hours 12 hours okay so uh, don't be confused so this is the answer for the question now we will move on to the third question in our series and this is from the renal system very important question and the question is nephrotic syndrome is characterized by so here we are asking about the um, clinical manifestations of nephrotic syndrome so the options for you are option number a hematuria azotemia hypertension option number b proteinuria edema and hyperlipidemia option number c hematuria proteinuria hypertension and option number d pyuria oliguria hematuria so uh, which all are the symptoms of nephrotic syndrome that is a question for you so what is the answer so the answer for this question is definitely option number b that is proteinuria edema and hyperlipidemia proteinuria means that the presence of protein or albumin uh, in the urine then edema and hyperlipidemia hyperlipidemia means that uh, the lipid content will be more in the blood so how it is coming so just we will have a small explanation regarding nephrotic syndrome Nephrotic syndrome, it is a collection of symptoms due to kidney damage and this include protein in the urea that is proteinuria, low blood albumin level because albumin will be, uh, will be lost in the urine. So, blood albumin will be low, then there will be high lipid blood lipid levels and significant swelling that is edema will be there okay so these are the classic features of nephrotic syndrome and the other there are some other features also that includes that. Uh, uh, weight gain because of edema there will be weight gain and uh, there will be uh, tiredness or uh, fatigue and there will be foaming urine will be there okay foam urine will be there and the complications of nephrotic syndrome include blood clots okay so these are the complications this hematuria can be seen as a complication not then as an initial sign okay so complications may include blood clots infections that is pyuria and uh, high blood pressure okay these are the complications so our question was regarding the nephrotic syndrome is characterized by that means in the initial symptoms the presenting symptoms okay so these are the complications so don't be confused that's why i have in few included these complications also in this session okay so i think that is clear for you you are getting so many information from this question now we will move on to the next question in our series uh, the question is the fourth question uh, it's a very interesting question question is which is the first tooth to erupt in a baby so which is the first tooth to erupt in a baby and the options for you are upper central incisor option number b lower central incisor then third option number c lateral incisor and the final option first molar so which is the first tooth to erupt in a baby so what is the answer 
so obviously the answer is option number b that is lower central incisor okay lower central incisor so we will have a look on uh, the order of the tooth development in a baby okay so first one to erupt is the lower central incisor it will be erupting in a six to eight ten months then comes the upper central incisor which will be erupting at around eight to twelve months so first lower central then upper central then comes the upper lateral incisor nine to thirty months then comes the lower lateral incisor that is a 10 to 16 months okay so this can interchange sometimes and uh, the first molar will be developing by 13 to 19 months and then comes the canine that is from the 16 to 23 months okay and finally the second molar will be erupted that is 23 to 33 months okay so this is the uh, uh, this is the uh, level this is the uh, order of the uh, tooth development in a baby so always remember the first thing is to erupt is the lower central incisor that is due in the six to ten months after uh, birth okay so i think that also uh, is a really informative question for you now we will move on to the fifth question in our series and another important question very very important question saliva produced in the parotid gland gains access to the oral cavity through dash okay so this is asking about the duct where the parotid gland saliva will release to the oral cavity through dash that is the question for you and the options for you are the first option is tensense duct second option number b bartholin's duct third option c latiferous duct and the final option water duct so all these are ducts and uh, you have to identify the duct through which the saliva from the parotid gland gains access to the oral cavity so what is the answer so easily you can uh, uh, omit two options very easily because that is not related to the saliva uh, production at all so the answer for the question is option number a that is stensense duct okay stensense duct so we will have a small explanation so we know that the parotid duct or the stensense duct is the root that saliva takes from the major salivary gland that is a parotid gland into the mouth so uh, one more information the major the major salivary gland in our body is the parotid gland and through the parotid duct or the stensense duct that saliva is draining into the mouth okay so then another option that was the bartholin's gland so otherwise known as the greater vestibular gland and these are two p-sized compound alveolar glands which are located slightly posterior and to the left and right of the opening of the vagina okay so bartholin's gland is related to the vagina not related to the saliva and all okay so bartholin's gland otherwise known as the greater vestibular gland and another option was regarding the lactiferous gland so from the name itself you can identify that this is related to the milk production or the ejection okay so lactiferous ducts are ducts that converge and form a branched system connecting the nipple to the lobules of the mammary gland okay so that is lactiferous duct and another option was the wharton duct or the submandibular duct or the submaxillary duct so this duct drains the saliva from the both bilateral submandibular gland and the sub lingual gland to the sublingual carangle at the base of the tongue okay so this is related to the salivary gland okay wharton's duct or the submaxillary or submandibular duct okay so i think uh, this is also clear for you now uh, we will move on to the sixth question in our series and the question is in the screen right now so the question is which is the most commonest site of intestinal obstruction so very easy question and very important question it was asked um, in the previous examinations so which is the most commonest site of intestinal obstruction okay so the options for you are option number a ileum option number b duodenum option number c sigmoid colon and option number d c cup so where we can expect the intestinal obstruction more so think about where the intestinal obstruction can happen whether in the small intestine or in the large intestine and if it is in the small intestine where it is so that is a clue for you so the answer for this question is definitely option number a that is ileum ileum is the most commonest site of intestinal obstruction so we know that intestinal obstruction the small intestine is the commonest okay so among the large intestine and the small intestine the small intestine is the most commonest area and in that ileum is the most commonest part and large bowel obstructions are really rare and if it happens also the sigmoid colon is the commonest sign 
site in large bowel obstruction okay so in large bowel obstruction sigmoid colon in small bowel obstruction ileum so our question was which is the most common so we know that Intestinal, a small intestinal obstruction is the most common and in that ileum is most common part. Okay, so don't be confused. Okay, so that's all regarding the that question. I think that is clear for you. Now we will move on to the next question in our series. That is the seventh question. So question is which type of hernia is most common among infants? Okay, so the question is in infants which is the most common type of hernia? So the options for you are option number A femoral hernia, option number B inguinal hernia, option number c umbilical hernia and option number d strangulated hernia so you should identify which type of hernia is most common among infants so what is the answer so definitely answer is option number c that is umbilical hernia umbilical hernia is most common among infants okay so what is an umbilical hernia so umbilical hernia it is a health condition where the abdominal wall behind the navel is damaged so it may cause the navel to bulge outward and the bulge consists of abdominal fat from the greater omentum or occasionally the parts of the small intestine okay so some uh, important information you are getting out of this uh, paragraph so it uh, the uh, um, the contents of the umbilical hernia are abdominal fat okay that is from the greater momentum okay this was a question which was asked earlier and sometimes we can get small intestines also okay so that is the umbilical hernia so why babies are prone for the development of umbilical hernia so that we will explain now so babies are prone to this malformation because of the process during the fetal development by which the abdominal organs form outside the abdominal cavity and later returning into it through an opening which will become the umbilicus okay so this is during the malformation during the fetal development not during the process of delivery okay so don't be confused okay this is during the fetal development time this malformation is happening okay and uh, another one more information for you that is the inguinal hernia it is a more common in older children and males okay so the question was regarding the infants so if it is older children or in case of the male inguinal hernia is the more common okay so uh, that is an additional information for you now we will move on to the next question in our series that is a eighth question this is a picture based question and you have to identify the spine deformity which i have shown in the screen right now so what is this spine deformity called so that's a question so very easy question but but slightly confusing so that confusion i will clear in the explanation session so um, the options for you are option number a kyphosis option number b low dosis option number c scoliosis and option number d port spine so uh, you have to identify uh, which spine deformity is this so what is this so the answer for this question question is obviously option number a that is this is kyphosis okay so we will have we will identify how we can differentiate between kyphosis low dosis scoliosis okay so this is a picture of a normal spine and this is a picture of the kyphotic spine okay so we can see the curvature here and we know that it is an abnormally excessive convex curvature we can see convex curvature of the spine as it occurs in the thoracic and sacral region okay so uh, another information is kyphosis can happen more in the thoracic in the thoracic area and in the sacral region okay so this is a excessive convex curvature so keep this picture in the mind okay this is kyphosis then next is the scoliosis so this is a straight spine and this is a scoliotic spine so you can see um, there is a sideways curve will be there so it is a medical condition in which a person's spine has a sideways curve okay sideways curve will be there that is sideways scoliosis like that you can uh, uh, remember okay so the curve is usually s or c shaped so okay s for scoliosis like that okay s or scoli uh, s or c shaped curve will be there and over the three dimensions okay so that is a scoliosis so kyphosis scoliosis then next comes the lordosis so what is the lordosis so here there will be this is a normal spine and this is a uh, picture of the low of a spine with low doses there will be exaggerated lumbar curve will be there so it is an abnormal inward concave lordotic curving of the cervical and the lumbar regions of the spine and it is known as a low doses okay so it is happening in the cervical okay it can happen in the cervical area and also in the lumbar region okay so there will be exaggerated lumbar curve and there will be concavity will be there okay that convexity is happening in the kyphosis 
but in the low doses there will be concave okay so a concave uh, curving will be there okay so the this is what is known as the low doses okay so i think you got the differences between kyphosis low doses and scoliosis and one more option i have given that was the last option that is a port spine so regarding the ports disease or the port spine already we have explained in our older videos you can go through those videos and uh, a small explanation it is a this is a tuberculosis of the spine and it is usually due to the hematogenous spread from the other sides often the lungs okay so the lower thoracic and the upper lumbar vertebrae areas of the spine are mostly affected in port spine okay so you can see the mri of a port spine here in the picture right now okay so that's all regarding that question that I think uh, that also was very interesting and a uh, good question now we will move on to the ninth question in our series and the question is the first functional organ to develop in embryonic life is so question is very simple very simple first functional organ to develop in embryonic life functional organ that is the key point so the options for you are option number a heart option number b lungs option number c brain and option number d kidney so which is the first functional organ to develop in embryonic life So the answer is option number A, heart is the answer. Obviously, you know the answer because we know that fetal viability will be checked in the uh, uh, the first scan itself. We can, we are searching for the fetal viability with the help of uh, uh, picking up the heart rate of the patient, okay, heart beating of the patient. So the first heartbeat we can um, uh, pick from the uh, fetus at three weeks, that is in the 21 days. And one more information, the thyroid gland is the first gland to develop in the embryo at the fourth week of gestation, okay. So, this is an additional information for you. So, the thyroid is the first gland to develop and the first organ, functional organ to develop in the fetus is the heart, okay. So, I think that also is useful for you. Now, we will move on to the very next question in our series that is a 10th question and uh, this is from the cardiovascular system important question very very important question which among the following is also known as pre-infarction angina okay so we are asking another name for the pre-infarction angina and the options for you are first one is a stable angina option number b exertional angina option number c unstable angina option number d variant angina so which angina is called as pre-infarction angina so what is the answer so obviously answer is option number C that is unstable angina. So we will have an explanation regarding the stable and unstable angina. So unstable angina otherwise known as the pre-infarction angina or the crescendo angina. Okay. So we know that this unstable angina means that is angina that is occurring at rest okay that is important at rest or with minimal exertion and it usually lasts more than 20 minutes okay so this will be a constant continuous and uh, not constant continuous pain will be there which will be last for 20 minutes at rest okay and it occurs with a crescendo pattern what is a crescendo pattern it brought on with a lesser activity then it will become more severe more prolonged and more increased frequency than previously okay so that means the pain will be escalating okay so otherwise known as in a crescendo pattern the pain will be there so that is otherwise uh, that's why it is otherwise known as a crescendo angina okay so i think you are clear about the unstable angina now now we will uh, explain about the stable angina so what is a stable angina it is otherwise known as a classical angina or the exertional angina or known as the effort angina so from the name itself it is you are, it will be uh, self-explanatory and it refers to the classic type of the angina related to the myocardial ischemia and a typical presentation of this angina is that there will be chest discomfort and associated symptoms which is precipitated by some sort of activities like running, walking etc with minimal or non-existent symptoms at rest. So at rest there will not be any symptoms but the symptoms will be aggravated with activity okay so that is a stable angina otherwise known as a classical or the exertional or the effort angina okay so i think um, these two differences you should understand and the names also you should understand you can expect such questions from this area okay so i think 
one more angina we have to uh, we have to identify that is the variant angina otherwise known as the prince metals angina or the vasospastic angina or the angina inversa okay angina inversa so this commonly occurs in the individuals at rest or even asleep and it is caused by the vasospasm okay so we have to compare uh, stable angina is due to the permanent occlusion of these vessels by the atherosclerosis okay among this so due, because of the permanent occlusion if a pain happens that will be a stable angina stable angina is due to the uh, occlusion of the vessels by the atherosclerosis and the vasospasm because of the vasospasm if the patient is getting pain that is known as a variant angina otherwise known as the prince metal or vasospastic or the angina inversa okay so i think that also is clear for you now now we will move on to the next question in our series that is the 11th question and the question is which among the following is not a symptom of right sided heart failure okay so another very very important question which among the following is not a symptom of right sided heart failure okay so the options for you are option number a crackles and wheezes option number b hepatomegaly option number c jugular venous distension and option number d ascites okay so from this option you have to identify which is not a symptom of right sided heart failure so right sided and the left sided heart failure it's, uh, it's a very very important topic in the exam point of view so what is the answer for this question definitely so from the options itself we can identify very easily so the option number a that is crackles and wheezes are not a sign of a symptom of a right sided heart failure it is a symptom of left sided heart failure so we will have a small explanation regarding the left and right sided heart failure so right sided heart failure is characterized by there will be collections okay so there will be collections and enlargement will be there that like that you can uh, uh, remember it okay so in right sided heart failure we will have ascites ascites is fluid collection mm, then hepatomegaly liver enlargement will be there then jugular venous distension will be there then oliguria will be there oliguria means that urine output will be less and obviously there will be weight gain because of the fluid collection weight gain will be there okay so these are the some important right, uh, features of the right sided heart failure so on the other hand the left sided heart failure will be presented with like dyspnea the more more over that uh, pulmonary features will be there like there will be dyspnea will be there and on auscultation we can hear crackles and wheezes and patient will have cough and there will be cyanosis also okay so this is a left sided heart failure okay so please understand uh, the difference between right sided and the left sided right sided always will be collection gain will be there and left sided always will be pulmonary symptoms okay so uh, that's all about that question i think that also was useful for you now we will move on to the next question that is the 12th question and another picture based question and the task for you in this session is to identify the structure i have marked okay so that bright blue colored structure what i have marked here in the brain so you have to identify that structure okay so the options for you are option number a cerebellum option number b brain stem option number c basal ganglia and option number d cerebral cortex so i think the option with the help of the options you can identify this structure very easily very important structure in the brain and in exam point of view uh, several times so many questions i have asked different in this area so that's why i have chosen this question so what is the answer you have to identify the structure so definitely the answer for this question is basal ganglia so this is the basal ganglia so uh, see uh, this is an easy picture that we can identify the different structures of the brain so this is the basal ganglia that is extending from here till here and uh, and the associated structures uh, are the important thing like uh, we will get hypothalamus here and thalamus here and amygdala pituitary gland everything okay so this is a cerebellum and this is a brain stem okay and uh, the other options okay just i am explaining so we have to uh, understand what is a basal ganglia so basal ganglia it refers to a group of uh, subcortical nuclei responsible primarily for the motor core control as well as other uh, roles such as the motor learning executive functions and behaviors and emotions okay so basal ganglia itself is a very is a group of subcortical nuclei okay so that you should understand and the function also you should understand and uh, we have some set of i told no it is a group of nuclei so uh, it is composed of the main components of the basal ganglia are the striatum okay so the striatum include the dorsal striatum and the ventral striatum okay we have dorsal and ventral striatum and the dorsal striatum contains a caudate nucleus and putamen okay so why i am i am explaining this is uh, we have questions from this areas before that's why i am explaining this 
so uh, the striatum it consists of the dorsal striatum which contains a caudate nucleus and the putamen and the ventral striatum which contains the nucleus accumbens and the olfactory tubercle and along with the striatum we have globus pallidus then ventral pallidum the substantia nigra and the subthalamic nucleus okay all these things are very very important in exam point of view also one example i will tell you have you heard about the substantia nigra the substantia nigra is the source of the dopamine so when Whenever there is a problem with the substantia nigra, there will be reduction in the dopamine secretion, and uh, this is having this have an important impact on the uh, development of Parkinson's disease and all. Okay, so that's why I am explaining this basal ganglia a little uh, elaborately. Okay, so identify you should uh, understand about this basal ganglia and its components. Okay, so that's all regarding the basal ganglia. This is also very very important. Now we will move on to the next question in our series that is the 13th question and the question is which among the following is an early sign of renal carcinoma okay so renal cell carcinoma which among the following is an early sign that is a question for you and the options are option number a low back pain option number b fatigue option number c hematuria and option number d lump in the abdomen okay so the key uh, point in the question is early sign early sign okay so what all options I have given are signs of renal cell carcinoma but you have to identify the early sign of renal cell carcinoma okay so these are the tricks in the question so what is the answer definitely the answer is hematuria hematuria is the early sign of renal cell carcinoma so we will have a small explanation so the initial symptoms of renal cell carcinoma include blood in the urine okay that is hematuria and the classic triad is hematuria the first symbol will be the hematuria then there will be flank pain and there will be there will be the presence of an abdominal mass okay and the other symptoms include weight loss fever high blood pressure night sweats etc okay so these are the some important uh, features of renal cell carcinoma and among that hematuria is the first symbol the sign that uh, we can see okay so moving on to the next question in our series that is the 14th the second last question from the psychiatry psychotropic drugs uh, the uh, a question for you is which among the following is the shortest acting benzodiazepines okay so which among the following is shortest acting benzodiazepine okay so the options for you are option number a diazepam option number b orazepam option number c triazolam option number d lorazepam so we know that uh, we have short acting long acting and intermediate acting benzodiazepines so you should learn that so my question now is which is the shortest acting benzodiazepine so what is the answer the answer is option number c that is a triazolam triazolam is the shortest acting benzodiazepines among these options okay so uh, we will see which all are the um, uh, types of benzodiazepines so the midazolam and the triazolam these are the short test acting uh, agents with a duration of action of 3 to 8 hours okay midazolam and triazolam are the shortest acting benzodiazepines then alprazolam lorazepam estazolam and tamazepam are the <coughs> uh, intermediate acting agents with a duration of action of 11 to 20 hours okay so this is intermediately acting alprazolam lorazepam estazolam then what about our diazepam and clodiazepoxide these are the long acting benzodiazepines okay diazepam and clodiazepoxide are the examples for long acting benzodiazepines okay so bunch of information from in this screen right now midazolam and triazolam short acting alprazolam lorazepam intermediate acting diazepam and clodiazepoxide long acting okay so that's all regarding the 14th question now we will move on to the very last question in our series the very very last question and the very important question and the question is asha program was established in which year so question is asha program was established in which year and the options for you are option number a 1996 option number b 1986 option number c 2006 and option number d 1976 so 76 86 96 2006 so which is the answer so when asha program was established and here also some confusion will have will be there so that i'll explain so the answer for this question is 2006 okay so you'll be confused when it was like 2006 or 2005 that i will explain now so one of the key components of the national rural health mission is to provide every village in the country with a trained female community health activist or asha 
uh, abbreviated as asha that is accredited social health activist okay and the cabinet approval happened on 2005 but it was launched in the year 2006 okay so it is established in the 2006 but the cabinet approval has happened on 2005 so in some uh, sites or the some textbooks uh, 2005 they have given answer but the approval was happened on 2005 but the launch was happened on 2006 okay so don't be confused so i think uh, uh, with the, uh, this question we are coming to the end of the session so the 15 questions what we have explained today is very very important and uh, i uh, i thank everyone who watched this video till the end and once again um, we thank you for the support you are entering for us and uh, once again uh, 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 kindly keep in touch uh, for the other videos to come and if you have any doubts or any clarification or if you want any uh, uh, much uh, information regarding any other topics you are free to ask so uh, once again thank you for watching the video so see you soon uh, in the next video bye